Hi, I'm MJ Hecox here at Leopold's where we pair our bottles with books. Our wine feature this month is Buza Tanat. This bottle is from Uruguay, which is a tiny little country the size of Washington State in South America. They're pretty new to the wine industry, but what they've done is really worked with a particular grape called Tanat. Tanat is a big grape, it's really ripe, it has big fruits, big tannins, complex finish, at least it does when you go with Buza. So this family, they specialize in premium Tanat, and you're really going to enjoy this wine with red meats and big flavored dishes. It's quite hard to get your hands on. We're excited to have it. It's also well lauded by the critics. Cheers. I want to thank everyone who's watching with us tonight, uh, both our, uh, our, our folks who are watching at home in Zoom and our Cap Times members who are here in person. Uh, for those of you watching at home, if you'd ever like to come and join us sometime here and uh, enjoy the finished dish and a glass of wine, all you need to do is become a Cap Times member. Uh, visit membership.captimes.com, make a contribution of any size, and then watch your email after that for invitations to future events. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors. Our first one is our official kitchen sponsor, where we are tonight, Kessenix. Uh, this is a great space. Uh, they are known for supplying restaurant kitchens, but any kitchen need you have at home, they can take, they can take care of too. Uh, I'd also like to thank our official wine pairing sponsor, which is Leopold's Books Bar Cafe. Uh, those of you watching at home uh, just saw a video from their sommelier uh, featuring a pairing for this month's, this month's dish. Uh, and you can stop by there to pick up that bottle of wine or any others or also their books or a cocktail or a coffee at their great location on Regent Street. Uh, wanted you to know too that if you are watching at home you also have a chance to win one of those bottles of wine just by asking questions. Uh, throughout the session tonight if you have questions for uh, Chef Lawler you can send them, send them to me by using the chat or the Q&A feature on the Zoom and I'll see those and I'll pass them along here and then at the end of the night we'll pick our favorite question and I'll let you know and uh, that person just needs to stop by Leopold's to, to pick that bottle of wine up for free. I also want to thank our uh, great video uh, partners Hinkley Productions for making tonight's live stream possible. So without further delay, I'm gonna turn it over to our own Lindsay Christians, who is our outstanding, our, our outstanding food editor. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, applause, this is great. This is already starting off beautifully. Uh, thank you so much for being here, Jake. Thanks for having me. Welcome. Uh, I think I first uh, met you and tasted your cooking with Delectable, and you were doing like basically a demo there. So this is old hat for you. This, is, this, this should be easy for me. <laughs> okay. I, I say that now before I do something weird. Right, exactly. <laughs> so first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you became a, a chef, a little bit of your background. Yeah. Uh, so I started cooking about 15 years ago. Uh, I started in a small butcher shop. Uh, fell in love with it day one. Um, I'm Wisconsin born and raised, so you'll see that the Wisconsin ingredients are very important to me. Um, I came to Madison in about 2012 um, and just fell in love with the city. Uh, spent a few years in between there in Chicago, but then just felt like I had to come back and now I'm here with you guys. Nice. So the dish that you chose tonight, uh, <laughs> one of our reporters described it as very meat forward, I think, or meat centric, um, but it's, to me it's very perfect for fall. Like I love the root veggies in it. Can you tell me a little bit about why you chose it? Yeah, so first of all, I absolutely love cooking in fall. Um, and then uh, I, I love pork. And what's better than pork wrapped in pork? I can't think of anything. Pork. Yeah, I so know. <laughs> that's where this whole idea of the dish started. And then after that, it was easy. Like, what, what do we have here in Wisconsin in fall? So we've got parsnips, we have carrots, and we have coffee. Yeah, it yeah. feels almost like a, a like a porchetta variation to me. Yeah, you're almost. Like yeah. Wrapping it up, but it's like much more accessible. And I love the use of the loin because it's just it feels very weeknight to yes. me. Like you could do this on a weeknight, um, which is lovely. So let's let's get started. Where do you want to start? All right. Um, so the first thing that we're going to start with is we are going to start with our cider glaze because that'll probably take the longest. Got it. Uh, that's assuming that you've already done your carrots, of course. I got my wine already here, so right. I'm set. So here we have uh, two cups of our apple cider. This is from uh, Fort Atkinson, so a nice Wisconsin product here. And then we'll just toss a little bit of sugar in there. And then we're gonna throw this on some heat, let it cook nice and slow while we're doing everything else. Do you put it on low heat or do you like bring it up to a simmer and then take it down? So we're gonna bring it up to a simmer and then bring it back down. This is a thing that the gas does so much more <laughs> like effectively and efficiently than my crappy electric oh, yeah, oven, which I'm just gonna impossible. complain about forever. I'm sorry guys. Uh, but it just, it takes so long and like I'm turning it down and it's like, we'll get there in five minutes. We'll go down a little bit. All right, and then, 
So the next thing we're going to do is we are going to make our parsnip puree here. Um, I have peeled most of the parsnips because I think that we probably have that <laughs> under control. Uh, but I do love to give some good tips, so here's a tip that I have. If you're peeling at home and you have a nice little uh, sheep tray here, you can peel right on top of it and that's going to make your cleanup much easier. For years I only had the kind of uh, peeler that's like a straight peeler, but then I noticed that everybody had these and so I got one and I like it way, way better. Oh yeah, this is much better. You can go a lot faster. The only thing is it's not double-sided. Oh. Uh, I'll get rid of this real quick. Parsnips are so sweet. They're so much sweeter, I think, even than carrots. Yeah, and you can even just smell the sweetness off of it here as we start to work Sugar. through them. All right, so we're going to kind of dice these up a little bit. Uh, we're not looking for anything perfect, seeing as it's just going to be uh, pureed up later. So we're going to take off this one side here. That's going to give us a nice, even place to uh, cut from. So it doesn't roll. So it doesn't roll on you because uh, we don't want any cut fingers tonight. I, I asked one chef, I was like, how do you like keep from cutting your fingers? Like a friend of mine who recently cut her finger while, while doing carrots. And she was like, well, just don't do that. <laughs> I was the, like, well, that's good. I'm, the real answer is we've cut our fingers a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just don't do that. I was like, well. So yeah, these, this dice doesn't need to be anywhere near perfect. We'll just get these all diced up, so we'll take a quick moment here. Oh, you can smell the sweetness from the parsnips. It's so lovely. Yeah, it almost has like a nice vanilla scent yeah. to it. I like to always have parsnips on hand, even if I don't, don't have like a plan for them, because they're great in stock. Oh, yes. They're really good in stock. Um, it's like one of my go-to. <laughs> and you can't put too much cabbagey stuff in stock, or that it tastes all like cabbage. So <laughs> I like the things that you can just add, and it will only make it better. I've met some people that will put almost anything in that stack. God, no. I've learned my lesson. All right. So then when we get down to these pieces here, we're not going to go exactly for a dice. We're just going to kind of uh, really thin slice these because that's going to be almost impossible to dice there. Where's your knife from? Uh, so this one is just a, a house knife, but I have a, a Koran knife here. This is a beautiful knife. Um, I highly recommend them. When I worked in Chicago, they actually came and did a demo for us, and of course, I had to buy one. <laughs> What's it called, Corin? Yeah. K-O-R-I-N? Yes. Nice. It's beautiful. You'll the fit knife. in with all the chefs if you have one. <laughs> I love seeing the different knives that chefs will bring, and I'm just like, I gotta up my knife game at home. Yeah, I've got a bag with probably far too many in it. <laughs> all right. I feel like this parsnip puree would also work really beautifully for Thanksgiving. Oh really? yes, like a mashed potato sub yes. or alongside with the mashed potatoes. Because it won't be as heavy as the mashed potatoes, I don't think. No, nowhere near. And it'll, you know, make all your friends think that you're uh, a foodie here. That, who doesn't want that? Yeah. Truly. All right, <laughs> so we're gonna do it in this induction burner here so you guys can get a good view of it. Uh, so this is grapeseed oil, uh, which is going to be much more flavorless. Uh, so you really get the flavor of the parsnips and everything else going into it. And grapeseed oil has a higher smoke point, I it, believe, as well. It does, yeah. It's up near the 400s. So you can, uh, if you're frying anything at home, it's great for that as well. I'd keep it on hand for frying that and canola and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. But canola is more processed, I think, than grapeseed is. I believe that's true, yeah. yeah. All right. And then while that's warming up, we're just going to get our onion ready. This Again, with this, it doesn't have to be a perfect dice. With a yellow onion? Yes. Okay. I wasn't sure. It looked like it might be a sweet. I love this onion cutting method. Yeah, hopefully I don't start crying. <laughs> <laughs> got to wear contact lenses. They protect you. <laughs> I make jokes all the time for the people that cry at work that they're going to get the onion goggles because they look ridiculous. <laughs> No. <laughs> and then for the garlic clove, we will simply just do a little smash here. Just uh, be careful using your knife, obviously. You don't want to take your hand with it. So with that, we're going to kind of like angle our knife down this way so this blade doesn't come back towards you. All right. We've got some garlic flying around here. I'm just going to put this over there. All right. 
So get the parsnips in here. Now we're gonna do the parsnips first because they're gonna take a little bit longer to cook. And we really, with the garlic and onions, just wanna sweat them. We want almost no color whatsoever there. Okay. For the smashed garlic, one thing that I will do at home is I'll take a kind of a heavy bowl and I'll do it with the bottom of a bowl because I'm afraid of that knife <laughs> I'm just nervous that I'm gonna catch myself. So as that's going, we're gonna kind of get set up for our coffee roasted carrots. I love this technique, this is cool. How, how did you develop this? Where did this come from? Um, so this actually comes from a chef that I worked with before, Chef Adam from the Madison Club. He uh, oh, showed Adam's me this one. Yes, yeah. and I absolutely fell in love with it. Oh, nice, okay. So we're gonna start by putting some coffee beans on the bottom here. And these uh, coffee beans are from Collectivo. Once you do this, can you still make them into coffee? Like, can you grind them and make them into coffee? <laughs> um, so it might have a little bit of a carrot flavor to it. So if you're good with that, yes. I don't see um, why that would be bad. But what I do with them is I reserve them for the next time that I'm going to do uh, anything um, coffee roasted. What else would you coffee roast if it's not a carrot? Um, so I do carrots a lot. Um, I have done parsnips before. Uh, celery root apple would be great. Basically any oh, root veggie. Your apple cider is a little intense. Right. So now that we got it to that simmer, turn it, okay. we'll turn it down a little bit. So you can see with these carrots, we're leaving just a little space here for the coffee to go in between them. So just like, like a half inch between maybe each carrot. Yeah. And you've left a little bit of the green top on. And I, they're what? These are carrots that are what, like an inch? Three quarter inch. Yeah, I'd say something about that. They're not like thick. You've seen the big carrots this time of year, they're like for juicing. They're not that big. But they're also not like baby carrots the way that I originally thought you meant them, which are those tumbled. Oh yeah, like the like grocery the tumbled, store carrots. Dry. Yeah. Alright, and then we'll add some uh, tin foil onto the top of this. This will kind of help it steam a little bit, uh, which will help the cooking process. Now this process takes two to three hours. So luckily I threw some in three hours ago. <laughs> We're just TV magic. <laughs> I love TV magic. All right, and then this will go into the oven behind us. Oh, I love that. This reminds me of, we had a chef on who uh, taught us how to smoke in that kind of thing with oh, like a, nice. like a little handheld smoker thing that can just like, you like put a little tear in there and you put the smoker thing in there and it just smokes it all up and it's really fun. It was a cool little technique. I have not tried it at home. So we can uh, start to see, hear, and smell these cooking. So we're about a minute or two away from adding our uh, onions and garlic to that. Um, so in the meantime, we will find another project to do. We'll make this uh, pistachio condiment, as I'm gonna call it. Just gonna make some cutting room space here. I love pistachios. I get them shelled now. I used to get them in the shell and just put them in front of my husband. Oh. I was going to say, you know, they taste better when you work no. for it. Well, I don't work for it in any case. Uh, he is the pistachio sheller and the shrimp tail remover. Hopefully my wife's bait. not on here. She might be getting some ideas. Uh, you just take pistachios and you put them in front of your partner and say, thank you, honey. All right, so now we're going to add these onions and garlic. And we'll let this cook for another three to five minutes before we add our white wine. Um, I prefer to use Chardonnay, but you can use whatever you like. All right, and then for these pistachios, we're just gonna give them a little bit of a rough chop here. Yes. How many times can you use the same coffee beans? I've used them like up to 10 times, but basically once the uh, flavor stops coming through, then you know to stop using them. So it's like, like the beans you use for pie crust. They just like live in your pantry and they're the pie crust beans. It's like that, but you yeah. just have roasting coffee. So when you guys fall in love with it, keep your roasted coffee. I like this. I was like kind of feeling sad at the idea that you couldn't use 
yeah. coffee anymore, but you can. You could just keep roasting stuff in it. Oh, what are pie crust beans? Pie, pie crust beans are like, like if you're like me and you're too lazy to buy pie weights for par baking a crust of pie. So you have to, when you're making a pie, right, you have to bake the crust partially, par bake the crust, and then you put your apples or whatever your filling is, and then you finish the bake. So you don't get a soggy bottom. <laughs> but I don't have pie weights. I have beans, which are basically just like dried, like they're like dried kidney beans, like a red kidney bean, and they're yeah. And so you just push the foil into your to your pie crust, and you put your beans on top of them, and it holds the crust down, keeps it from bubbling while you do that first par bake. I use them a lot this time of year when we're making pie, um, which is really great. I just made an amazing apple thing called zarlatka, which is a cross between a pie and a cake. Ooh. It was so Ooh. good. Technically, it's like Eastern European Russian, I think, but it's called Zarlutka. Um, and I gave like half of it to my neighbor. I need to come into the newsroom more That's and bring this stuff. <laughs> and just bring you all my things that I'm baking. Yeah. So our next step for the pistachio condiment is we're gonna do the shallots. Now this is probably the most um, intensive part of this. Uh, and this part of the recipe actually comes from uh, a quite famous chef, uh, Joel Robichon. Mm. I think I read his biography memoir. So I uh, I worked with one of his first uh, American-born chef de cuisine. Oh wow! Yes, so that's where I learned most of this stuff from. All right, so let's get this up. I should have brought a paring knife. So if you're having troubles with the shallot like I am, uh, grab a paring knife, not a chef's knife, and you can just simply grab that shell or that peel with it. I like that you said that. There's, there are modifications for those who are not as dexterous. Yes, like me. and this still is not working very well. All right, so we're gonna dice this as small as we possibly can. We have a paring knife. Look at knife. that, and a paring knife appears. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. You can see how much easier it is once you get this paring knife, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. You take a little bit of the shallot with you, that's fine. Now we've got a beautifully clean shallot. So we're gonna cut this very similar to an onion. Uh, we're gonna make a few cuts this way. And you leave the root end on because it holds that allium together. Yes. And then we're gonna come back through this way. And this one we gotta be a lot more, pay a little bit more attention with because we're not gonna cut this again. So we want it as small as possible the first time. At home, if you need to go through this one more time, feel free. So you can see, it's very nice and thin. I don't, there's like a level that's slightly smaller than that, that's what, Brunois? Brunois, yeah. Yeah. Every time I see Brunois on a plate, I think a chef is showing off. Do you know how long it takes to cut that? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not surprised. Like. It is a show off move, right? Like, it's kind of like, oh, look at that. That's kind of cool. All right, so we're going to grab our ice water next. You can see we got a little color there. It's not exactly what we're going for, but it'll work just fine. So at this point in time, we're going to add our white wine. I would just do anything that's not sweet. Like, I wouldn't put Riesling in it, but like, if I've got a soft Blanc or uh, something else open. Yeah, that would definitely work just fine. I have a question from your mother, Lindsay. <laughs> 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 she wants to know if you can uh, squash, the squash the shallot, squash the shallot like you do the garlic. <laughs> oh, can you smush it? Can you smush yes. the shallot? It's it, gonna be different. Um, <laughs> that's, it, I think it would be a, a little difficult. Um, so, so the dice is definitely the best way to go. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna take this shallot here and we're gonna toss it into this little bar strainer here. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna dip these down into the ice water. And that just takes some of the rasp or the bite out of them? Like so it's gonna, it's gonna do that and then it's also going to crisp them up. Oh. Uh, so you'll get a nice little crunch when you bite down into it. And then we have some paper towels here. You're gonna toss it on a paper towel, dry it off. So they weren't in there for very long. It's just like a really quick. Yeah, 
but we're gonna do this three times. Oh. That's where it That's gets fun. That's the Ribichon yeah. thing. Because <laughs> if you know anything about that, we've got to make it difficult. <laughs> it reminds me of Mignonette. Oh yeah, it gives, you know? gives big Mignonette vibes for Doesn't sure. Doesn't it? Yeah. All right. There might be a better towel for this. Like your at-home paper towel would probably work slightly better. I was just on vacation and I ate street oysters twice. Nice. And it was great both times. <laughs> He's like, this is a dude on the street. He's just shucking oysters outside the shop. Can't I'll be eat bad. that. Heck yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. Where were you? We're in London. So it was very cool. All right, so now we're gonna let these sit here and just dry under that nicely. How many times do they do it in the Ribichon kitchen? Like seven, 12? We, we did it three times. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're, we're, ah, okay. we're doing the real process okay. here. <laughs> I was like, how much more annoying was it in real life? <laughs> but that wouldn't have been diced fine enough. I would have been told to dice ah, another really? one. Ah, yes. really? Um, so now we're going to add, this is our calamansi vinegar. Um, I get mine from Von Foss, as you guys have seen in the recipe there. Um, so what a calamansi is, is it's a mixture of fruits. It's kind of almost like a lemon, a lime, and an orange all together. Um, and it's just absolutely delicious. We'll just pour that right in. So it's citrus vinegar. Yes. So if you don't have calamansi vinegar, you're gonna go with like a Meyer lemon vinegar? Or... A Meyer lemon vinegar would be great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, and then we're gonna toss these guys in here. And then we'll just mix it up nicely. And then we'll set this aside, let all the flavors kind of come together. So are those pistachios toasted already? These are already toasted, Okay, yes. so, but they don't have salt. Uh, they do have a little bit of they salt. They do have a little bit of yeah. salt, okay. So if you are just gonna like, there's like levels of pistachios in terms of like how processed they are. You can get them roasted and salted and shelled. And they're delicious. That's my favorite way to do it now. Heck yeah. I have friends who like have, do either like the whole peeled garlic cloves, just like a thing of peeled garlic, all the way to like a garlic that is chopped in a jar. Yes, my, yeah. My friend Joanna has chopped in a jar. And so now when I write recipes, I'm like teaspoon of chopped garlic as well as clove. Like I'll do both. <laughs> oh, nice, it's yeah. Specifically for her. Like, I don't know if she uses them, but I'm thinking of her. All right, and then I, uh, our next step here is, I'm gonna show you how to roll the pork. So we've got a beautiful pork tenderloin here. This came from our good friends at uh, the Meat People, but more importantly, it came from the Fisher Family Farms. This is uh, pasture-raised pork, so it gets to walk around freely. It's as happy as you or me. I've actually of course, until it's eaten. been out, I think I've been out there. It was several years ago, not like 2017. Yeah. But it's real pretty. It's like lovely big Wisconsin farmland. Yeah, I mean, if, if you guys have free time, just like pick a local farm and go get something from them. They'll show you around. They'll just be happy to see you. <laughs> All right. So this piece here is already cleaned and everything. Um, you can see like a little bit of fat here. This amount of fat is okay, but if there's more, you might want to trim yours. Or silver skin? Do you trim So yeah, definitely skin? silver skin. We won't want any of that on there. But the meat people are great, and this is fully broken down for us. What happens if you leave the silver skin on? Is it texturally gross? Like, it's um, texturally weird. Silver skin is, like, almost inedible. Like, uh, you'll oh, be sitting so there and chew it on it forever, Got yeah. Got it, okay. <laughs> it's a mouth exercise. <laughs> All right. That's a smaller loin than you will often see, like a Hormel, you know, like a... Yeah, so being a nice, fresh, local product, this is definitely what it should look like. All right, so we're gonna pull out about five pieces here of our prosciutto. My favorite place to get prosciutto now is Costco. I do oh, like nice. getting uh, prosciutto at Costco. You can get kind of a lot for not a lot of dollars, but you yeah. can buy a lot of prosciutto, but it's cured. But yeah, you it can't go wrong with having a bunch time. of prosciutto. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Enough. All right. This feels like an art project, and I'm here for it. It is about to feel a lot more like an art project. <laughs> We're just gonna like paper mache this pork. You know, like when you blew up the balloon and you did paper mache over and make a world. Remember this? Yeah. All right, so then we'll kind of trim this up just a little bit. Trimming it to make it even? 
Just, yeah, uniform. Should repeat the question so that... Oh. oh, he's trimming it to make it uniform, to make it even. That's why the trim. But all that stuff, is, that stuff is edible. That is, uh, that is <laughs> very edible. Uh, <laughs> all right. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. Chris, you need some of this. <laughs> Have some. So good. It tastes just so happy. All right. So before we put the pork onto the prosciutto here, we're actually going to give it a nice little season here. And we want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're seizing our stuff as we go. Salt. Yep, yes. the salt, and then it's followed by pepper. <laughs> and then we're going to flip it over, and we're going to do the same. Now, you'll notice that I'm not putting the normal chef amount of salt on here. Uh, that is because the prosciutto itself is going to be salty. That's actually a very home amount of salt. Yes. Like a <laughs> what I would normally do. <laughs> um, because we are cooking the pork with the prosciutto, could you do this with pancetta? Yes. Okay. If you just want to play with your cured meats for fun. All right. And still do the pork around pork thing. Yeah, because who wouldn't want to do pork around pork? All right, so. I mean, I know some people, but they're not here tonight. <laughs> That's, <laughs> that is true. I think I met them this morning. <laughs> we love you, Lauren. <laughs> All right, so then we're going to grab some uh, plastic film here. Sorry. Sorry, I'm in your way You're here. Good. So if you put it in the fridge like this, it sort of firms it up a little. Is that yeah. the goal? It'll it'll kind of, and especially with the salt, it'll kind of make it bind to itself there. But then also the process we're about to do here will help as well. So we're going to stick it in here, and we're kind of going to roll this up. But the first step, you're going to take your plastic wrap here, and you're gonna fold it back towards yourself two times. So that's gonna give you a nice place to be able to open it up when you finally need it. Oh, that's totally something I would forget to do. And then as we roll, we're gonna make sure we keep this nice and tight. It's like making sushi rolls. Yes. Except it's pork. And then uh, at this point, you'll grab these two sides here and just kind of roll. <laughs> I'm just like thinking about um, toffee candies, like <laughs> the way that you do a toffee. And then if it's not tight enough, you can kind of give it the good old twist. And then we're gonna tie a little knot in here. This is such an art project, I love it. Make sure that's nice and tight. And then I cut off this side here. That's just fear of getting yelled at by old chefs. <laughs> I think about that whenever I put tape on something that's not like squared off. Oh yeah. Cut the tape. Cut the tape. And I'm just like, I don't need to cut my tape. I'm in my own kitchen. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but you think about, like, cut the tape. And then we're going to take this guy and just toss him in the refrigeration real quick. How long do they need to be in the fridge to have the effect that you're looking for? 20 minutes? So generally you want a few hours. Okay. Um, but 20 minutes is better than zero. 20 minutes is better than no minutes. A few hours is better than 20 minutes. <laughs> Got it. All right. And so, as we were doing that, we can see that our white line here reduced down nicely. Could but, you do the pork the day before you're serving it to people? Yes. Okay. That, that would honestly be ideal. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So I'm having people over on Friday night. I can do it the day before. Yeah. yeah. That's today. <laughs> do it now. <laughs> right now. Or you'll never eat. Just run out of here and grab some pork. I'll do oh it. God, like, it's like, it's <laughs> I am having some people over this weekend, but too many of them are vegetarians. I have just, I have just vegetarians in my life. <sighs> All right, so now that the wine's cooked down a little bit here, we're gonna add our heavy cream. Um, I'm making a little bit more than you guys here, so at home we're gonna do two cups, here we're gonna do about four. Yeah, this feels very Thanksgiving to me. I mean, it's my favorite kind of food, so it would make sense. <laughs> All right, and then at first it's going to look like too much. But we're going to let this cook down, and the parsnips are going to kind of start to soak it up. Um, so we'll want a little bit of excess. It'll help us blend it later. I think if your pork line that you're working with at home, if you're not able to get like a 
the small one like that. I think, and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna say this and s clarify that it's true. You could you could just cook it until it's the right temperature, right? Yes. Yeah. Just so, make sure you're temping it out using a, a thermometer, but you could still do all the same things even if you have a bigger pork one. Yes. Yeah, okay. Or if you have like a bunch of people to feed, you could even sub it for a pork loin instead of a pork tenderloin and get a really big one. Oh, right, you right, just right. might I've need a few pieces of yes. uh, prosciutto there. Yeah. All right. So I believe the next step that we need to take is going to be cooking the pork. So we're going to grab our perfectly cooled pork loins right there. They look cool. They look like meat candy. And then when you get to this part, we're just going to cut off one of these sides here. And then you find that little groove that we made earlier. I'm so nervous to use my knives to do that. I feel like someone's going to yell at me. I always like grab my scissors and do it because I'm like, I don't want to hurt the knife, but the knife is fine, right? And you can, oh, the, the knife's fine, yeah. We, it can always get resharpened. Scissors are safer. <laughs> so you, and you can, you can see here um, the difference between the one that we just did. This prosciutto is really kind of connected to it. <coughs> Could you add a layer of something in between the prosciutto and the... See, I, I had never thought of that until you said porchetta, and now some sort of mousse would be amazing in there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be great. When I make it at home next time, that's what's happening. All right. I like it when someone else has assembled the porchetta for me. That's <laughs> what I like the best. Yeah, the assembling is definitely the hard part. It's annoying. And My I favorite part is the eating. <laughs> um, so we're also going to pull the one that we just made out just to make sure that we have enough um, here. And through my testing of this recipe, I actually found that we don't need to sear this. We can go straight into the oven with it. Ooh, that's cool. It's really nice. I like not having the extra step. I actually kind of love this because we'll see it as a point of comparison. Oh, yeah. And you can see, like, it just already looks a touch looser. Yeah. These are all made with the same prosciutto. These were just made five hours ago today. So you can see they're not quite as tight. This makes the whole uh, piece quite more uniform as well. So this will cook the same, where, like, this end will cook differently than this end. So it really is beneficial if you can put it in there for a few hours to do it that way. So we got a little uh, half hotel pan here with a uh, little resting rack on it. Hotel pan just means sheet pan that's smaller. Uh, I meant to say sheet pan. <laughs> hotel pan is a little deeper. Yes. <laughs> All right, and then this is going to go into the oven here, and we're going to do this for about 15 to 20 minutes. All right. I also love that this oven here is here because this is the one I'm used to. Cool. All right. What temperature do you have? It is at, uh, the oven is set to 350. So pretty low. Yeah. So we want to make sure that we have enough time to cook the pork um, without actually uh, overcooking the prosciutto on the outside. Got it. Okay. And, and there's no more seasonings except the, the prosciutto on the pork, right? The question is about seasonings on the pork, that there's no additional seasoning. So at this point in time, there are no additional seasoning. Um, when we slice it open, we will put a little bit more salt. Okay. And then I think we are going to move this off induction and just get it moving a little bit faster. Okay. to farms recently, right? Oh, yeah. What did you get from farms? Um, so we got some beautiful parsnips here. These guys came from uh, the Harmony Valley Farm uh, out near Viroqua. Did you go to Viroqua to get those parsnips? It's a beautiful drive. It's two hours. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, like, not that close to here. I mean, it's pretty, but I'm sorry, Viroqua. We love you. Um, I just, wow, OK. Um, and then I did get our apple cider um, from a local farm here in Sun Prairie. They sourced it from uh, Fort Atkinson, um, so we didn't have to go quite so far for that one. And then the pork we got from the meat people, 
and there were supposed to be some mini pumpkins for decoration that somebody forgot at home <laughs> that were also from the local farm. <laughs> who forgot? Uh, who could it have been, yeah. I have an audience question here. Oh, yeah. Let's see. It is Carolyn who wants to know if it is more difficult to make sushi or the uh, prosciutto wrap pork. That's a great and why question. why is that? <laughs> yeah. If it wasn't for the rice, it might be the pork, but the rice is pretty difficult for sushi, so I would say sushi. <laughs> We, I tried with friends in grad school, we like had a little like, we're gonna roll our own sushi night and we made, I, I didn't realize you could screw up rice that badly. <laughs> oh yeah. Like you can really mess it up. And I've messed it up so many times now. Like I feel like I keep trying and it just, it's gummy or it's too, like I have too much vinegar or it's, yeah. yeah. But the rolling part, like getting it right, the right stickiness and the right temperature. <gasps> I don't do so it anymore. No, yeah. I, I prefer to pay for my sushi. Yeah, me too. <laughs> like you can get beautiful ingredients and then just destroy them. It's very sad. Right. Carolyn also wants to know if you have water or oil on your fingers and does that make it easier? Um, not on my fingers, but if when you're rolling out that pork, if you, if you do get the table wet, it'll kind of catch that uh, clean wrap a little bit and make it roll much easier. So that, that is a great question. Oh. A little bit of dampness on the... Yeah, because nice. that'll, yeah, that'll just catch that uh, the saran wrap there and help roll it up really nicely. So I think we might have a leader for best question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good question. So the pistachio condiment that you have here? Yes. Um, I feel like I would be tempted a little bit to overcomplicate it. Are there other things that you could add to that? You, you could definitely add some other things to this. Um, you know, you could introduce another nut Herbs. or... Um, a different Ooh. kind of herb, uh, you know, like some tarragon or chives would go in there really well. Cranberry. Yeah, or pomegranate Cran seeds I love. Like, I just saw pomegranates for the first time at the store, and Ooh. I'm like, yes. yes. We're in pomegranate season. And pomegranates would go great with this I, dish. I bought two really, really big ones. I love them so much. I just remembered that. So at this point, we're kind of just waiting for this parsnip puree to cook down a little bit. But while we do that, we'll pull out our... And to be clear, you have not pureed it yet. There's I still, have... like, chunks of... Yeah, so there's still... All the chunks are still in there. Um, we're going to toss that in a Vitamix in about 10 to 15 minutes here uh, to make it nice, smooth, and silky. Okay. If you have an immersion blender at home... It will work. It will work. Okay. But it's going to be, like... It's not gonna be quite so smooth. They won't have like the buzzwords of velvety or silky. <laughs> I just I don't own a Vitamix and they are they are available here at Castex, but they're <laughs> kind of a gazillion dollars. They are very expensive. All right. Yeah. So you, for everybody that's in person here, you can probably already smell the coffee. carrot in there so we can see here I have uh, tweezers at home you might have a fork or something <laughs> like that if that can easily go in like that you know that your carrots are fully cooked so we're gonna just shove this guy back in here and we're gonna set this back on the stove in a place where it can stay warm uh, just for plating later you just put your hand in there how it's, okay it's, it's pretty hot it's, it's chef just, hands yeah us chefs don't feel much anymore <laughs> I've learned my lesson. <laughs> it is a real thing. All right, since, since we have a second, I think it's time for a story about that. Yes, okay. Um, so I had just been working in the restaurant for maybe three or four years, um, so I didn't think my kitchen hands were quite there yet. Uh, but my roommate and I were cleaning out our microwave, and I pulled out the, uh, the glass part and handed it to him, which he immediately threw on the ground and broke. Oh. And I was like, what is your problem? And he looks at me and he says, no, what, what's your problem? How did you just grab that? Like, that's very hot. Yeah. And I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't feel anything. So yeah, that, was, that was my first chef hand experience. I have seen people like reach into this oven here, just like reach in and grab something out. I'm like, dude, what do you want? That's just. We, we have an, a, a question, a related yeah. question about what is your worst Chef accident. <laughs> Ooh. I, I guess the question I have to ask is, does everyone want to hear it? Because <laughs> it's, it's pretty bad. Does it involve oil? 
Uh, so you got ten fingers, so um, I think. I have eight point something fingers. <laughs> um, so my worst accident was when I got bit by a meat slicer. So these two fingers here are slightly misshapen. The good news is you don't feel it until afterwards. <laughs> no, it's true with every accident. <laughs> but yeah, that that by far was the worst. <laughs> They st and they still work just fine. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let's see. All right. Um, I bet if you came around from the So um, along with like the carrots, how we pierced them with something to see how they were, uh, we're going to do the same thing with our small little parsnips there. Um, they'll cook much faster, but they're also much harder to like grab. So this is where the tweezers come in handy. At home, I'm probably using a slotted spoon. What are you using? A slotted spoon. Um, I don't have tweezers. Um, they're, they look great, but I don't own them, so I would probably just slotted spoon that business and see. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. The, the tweezers also take some time to get used to. Yeah. All right. So at this point now, we've had our pork in the oven for a little while, so we'll just take a quick look at that. just gonna keep doing that I think yeah it's mad I have the door open all right so we've got probably another 10 to 15 minutes on that yet okay well I think we're getting toward the end here we sure bit. are yeah so but I'm I'm gonna ask you a little bit a couple questions here sounds while great we're waiting for things to cook yeah um, I am just curious as as fall comes around you said it's your favorite it sure season is. to cook what other things are you cooking right now that you're excited about like what what do you look forward to in the fall? So fall, almost every single one of my dishes is going to have parsnip uh, in some sort of way. Um, but duck goes great with all of the fall ingredients. Um, I love I love pork for fall. Um, you could definitely make a steak in a way that would be great for fall. It just doesn't translate quite as well as like a pork loin or some duck wood. Um, but anything with like a cider glaze, a little mm -hmm. bit of coffee, all of that is going to be great. I think the first version of this recipe had mushrooms involved in it. It sure did, yes. Yeah, do you cook a lot of mushrooms? I See, I personally love mushrooms, uh, so I will cook a lot of mushrooms, but I know that it can be a little bit polarizing, so I decided to keep them off this time. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, Sharon watching at home wants to know if you salt the parsnips. Um, so we, we do salt the parsnips, um, and the question was if we, oh, you, you asked the question. Yeah. Um, so the parsnips, as they're cooking right now, we're about to add some salt in there. And we'll add little bits of salt throughout the cooking process. We're not gonna add a lot, but just a little bit as we go on, and that's gonna create what we call like the layers of flavor. Nice. So that's actually a great question because it's time for salt. Mm. I love the slow roast on those carrots. Would you ever do like a mix of things? Would you do carrots and something else at the same time? You sure could. Um, any other root vegetable will go great with it. The root vegetables tend to go really well together anyway. Um, so you could do the celery root, you could do uh, parsnips with it as well. Um, even something like a rutabaga. Mm -hmm. And beets. beets, yeah, that would work too. Um, and then there's, there's also a, another form of this that you can do, which is uh, salt baking. Yeah, I've, I've never tried this because yeah. it just seems like so much salt and I'm like, well, what happens to it afterwards? You just kind of toss it, I think. Yeah, because it, it gets all clumped up. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. But it works really good for like uh, like a rutabaga or something that's a little bit larger. If you were to do like a carrot, it might like absorb too much of that saltiness to it. Mm -hmm. So you could do a mixture of coffee roasted and salt baked. Um, or you could do parsnips and carrots in that same thing. The biggest thing you're looking for there is just making sure you have root vegetables of the same size. Mm -hmm. The cider has been on for quite a bit of time now, and you're looking for it to like reduce by how much? So the cider is gonna reduce about three quarters of the way down, and it's gonna turn into kind of a syrup looking thing. Luckily, <gasps> I've got some right here. Whoa. <laughs> so this is, at That's the moment. It's very syrupy, oh my it, goodness. It's a little cold. So it's a little bit more syrupy than it will be when it's hot, but you're looking for something close to this. Looks like honey. Can you make a cocktail with it? Oh my God, can you make a cocktail with it? That's a great question. I, I, 
<laughs> I think we should make a cocktail with that. <laughs> that would be amazing. It, it's got to be bourbon or rye. It's like, got, yeah, it's got to be bourbon or rye. Right? But that sounds absolutely right. delicious. <laughs> Who has some bourbon? Oh, boy. What are your favorite places to shop for ingredients is another uh, Ooh. Um, question. So for ingredients, um, you'll probably locally find me either at like the Jenny Street Market or uh, the Willie Street Co-op. You're an uh, Eastsider, it sounds like. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And um, I, I like Jenny Street a lot, so that's where I'm going to be most of the time. Uh, we work with them at Vintage, so we've formed a really good relationship there. That's great. This is this is really lovely. I feel like one of my um, one of my pet peeve recipe instructions is like reduce by half. Because yeah. then what I'll do is I'll take it and I'll measure it and I'll be like, well, is it half? Nope, not yet. <laughs> well, is it half? Nope, not yet. Like literally. And I know I probably shouldn't do that. Like yeah. I, but I just it always I. I know. Just relax. <laughs> I'm an anxious cook. So since since we are on the topic of that, there are some like signs that you can look for. So for the cider, um, when it starts to get down to that uh, reduction that you're looking for, it's going to start to bubble intensely. Uh, it'll almost look like it's going to start to burn. Um, that's going to be the time that you want to actually pull it immediately from the heat. Um, but yeah, when you start to see intense bubbles, you're getting very close. So you're saying that like we don't really have to pay attention to it until the very end when we really do and yeah. have to do something very that's, fast. That, that's the worst part about it. So we make a lot of uh, these reductions at, at Vintage and uh, that'll be one of the first things we throw on in the morning and then inevitably you completely forget about it and it's like, where's that smoke coming from? <laughs> <laughs> this is my whole thing. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was recently uh, behind the scenes in the Top Chef kitchen for like a challenge which I can talk about in March um, because it's not airing until March but one of the things that happened was somebody was burning something on purpose and they kept yelling it's on purpose it's on purpose it's on purpose like that's the smoke's <laughs> on purpose and I just I think about that like in a in a kitchen where lots of people are doing different things usually smoke means yeah bad and Whoops, uh, you know in the kitchen everyone will let you know that something's burning Right. <laughs> yeah, they won't let you know that it's about to burn, but they'll let you know that it is burning. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? It's just how it works. So you worked at several restaurants uh, around the area. Obviously, you worked at Delectable. That's where I ran into you. But you also worked at Indelafield at ID. Is that right? Yes. So uh, that's that's actually where I went when I came home from Chicago. Okay. Um, and I met some of the most important people in my life there. Okay. Yeah. ID and Delafield is still still running, right? Like it, it sure is, yeah. Take a little road trip. Uh, my wife and I actually went pretty recently and they're still doing a great job. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. The chef there, I think, used to be at Madison Club, maybe? He was uh, Edgewater. Edgewater. Yeah. There we go. Yep. And uh, now he's running that one and the Red Circle Inn as well. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Did you work at Red Circle Inn too? I, I did. And then uh, they actually ended up selling that company to the same company that Joe works for. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Are there things that you take from those places that you? I, I tend to take um, like ideas and um, recipes from, from chefs that I have worked with. They just tend to influence everything that you've done. All right, so it looks like we're starting to get pretty close here on this parsnip puree. Chris, was there a question? There is. Okay. Uh, Carolyn wants to know if there are any underrated spices that you like to cook with. That, that Salt and pepper. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> Underrated. Um, I I really am a salt and pepper guy. Um, spice blends. I really don't. I don't use a whole lot. Um, some things that would go great in this would be some um, like allspice or any of those good fall spices. Uh, I guess those tend to be my favorite. Uh, I'll throw it in with like a squash puree or something like that. We call that one the pumpkin spice latte puree. Oh, very nice. Yes. Very nice. I have been uh, on the deliciouser train ever since we had them on, and so I've been doing a lot of uh, the umami or spice recently. Oh, nice. Uh, but they also have one called miso yaki, which actually has miso in it. Like Ooh. The spice one. It's delicious. That sounds I'm going to yeah. have to try that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so I'm going to bring this parsnip puree up here. It's not quite ready yet, but you guys can kind of see now that the uh, cream... The cream here is starting to cook into everything. 
Uh, we still have just a little bit of time left on this one before we blend it up. We're looking for it to soak up just a little bit more, but here you can actually see we've lost almost a quarter of the cream that we've put in. Okay. All right, we'll check that pork again. Probably still a little bit out. Starting to get some crispy prosciutto though. You can see the steam like. <laughs> what? <laughs> I did set off the smoke alarm at the Verbo in London, and we had no idea how to turn it off. It's <laughs> truly none. Like, we waved at it and opened all the windows and waited. Uh, when I cook at home, it's almost inevitable that yeah. the smoke alarm's because gonna I, go off. I don't know how to like disable a, a UK flat. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was like, I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't my fault. It was stuff in the oven already. It was... It's the same thing at my house, but it is my fault. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the pork, it smells like bacon. It smells really good. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there are any other questions from folks here. I don't want to like open it up if you guys have questions. Ooh, we must be doing a good job. Oh, yeah, we're doing great. Mm -hmm. I like the I like the uh, the tip about waiting for the cream to absorb into the parsnips yeah, and, and like great. looking like it's it's going to be too much, but then it's actually not. Yeah, and that's just something that I've learned along the way. And then when I, when I saw that, I realized that like that was a good way that I could train my cooks. And once I trained them that way, uh, they made the purees properly. So it just makes sense. It works for everyone, you know. Nice. A cook at, at work or somebody cooking at home. Nice. So the the Vitamix, if somebody doesn't have one, as I said, immersion blender, or you would want to wait a little bit before putting it in like a regular blender. Yeah. Um, you know, otherwise like, it goes. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Cover it and hold it down. <laughs> Cover it, hold it down. <laughs> I remember when I was first learning how to cook, I would uh, make my purees in a magic bullet. That was interesting. How'd that go? <laughs> you would like open it up and it would kind of like shoot out at you a little bit. So it was like kind of like a this thing. <laughs> Goodness gracious. All right, so I'm gonna pull this pork out now. We're at about 135 degrees, which gives it a good time to rest. Is pork like cookies in that it will continue to rise a little bit once it's out of the oven? Yeah, so this, this will probably carry over the rest of the way that we need to go. And now this is, this is a really good example here. So you can see, these are the two that I made this morning. And this one here is the one that we just recently made. It didn't really stick to it quite as much as we wanted. So if you have the time, it really is better to do it a few hours ahead of time like that. So we're just gonna set this up here and let this rest. <laughs> Those, that's enough for what, 12 or so? Yeah. One, so one pork line for three or four people. Yeah, and you know, if you're feeding some uh, younger age, like college boys or something like that, maybe, maybe, maybe two, maybe two. <laughs> I like it. Well, one more audience question. Any ideas to incorporate mushrooms in simple recipes? Mm. Um, depending on the recipe, my favorite way to cook a mushroom is just gonna be butter. Wait until you see some caramelization. And then once that happens, you're gonna toss in thyme and garlic and you can't go wrong that way. Um, when you toss in the thyme and garlic, you really want that butter to still be sizzling. Uh, if that butter is not hot enough, then you're not going to be infusing those flavors whatsoever. I like to use cast iron for mushrooms. Yeah, yes. For like what that, happens. Yeah, that's um, great. But also I've seen people go a couple different ways with salting and when you salt with mushrooms because you can bring out too much of the liquid Yeah, inside so it. you're definitely going to want to wait a little bit on the salt because if you salt that mushroom and you put it in the pan, all that liquid's going to come out and you're just going to end up steaming your mushrooms. And I've done it. And that's why you get the people that say that they don't like mushrooms. Yes. Or my husband who used to have them in cans. <laughs> Do you salt the mushrooms afterwards? Yes, oh. you, you sure can. And you're using fresh herbs, not dried herbs. Fresh yes. herbs, not dried herbs is the question, yeah. Woo. All right, so we're going to add just a little bit more salt to this. We're just about at blending point we're just going to make sure that these are cooked up nicely parsnips take a little bit longer than carrots they're harder right like they're 
Yeah, and you can see here we're like moments away, but we have a few bigger pieces. With this, it's better to overcook than undercook. Okay. Yes. Ooh, a tip for onions. I'm gonna repeat it for our folks at home. If you don't want to cry when you're cutting onions, refrigerate them. Ah, if you don't want to cry when you're cutting onions, you refrigerate them. That's great. That's delightful. Also, I if you start crying, if you're lucky enough to be in a restaurant, go into the walk-in cooler. If you're not lucky enough to be in a restaurant, just stick your head in your fridge for like a second. Like open your fridge. <laughs> <laughs> just refrigerate them. It's a whole lot yeah. Just refrigerate I'm, I'm definitely going to try that. you got to have that fridge space. Yeah. I've done it for 40 years. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, I Beautiful. love that. I, I love this parsnip recipe in part because I feel like you could kind of switch up the alliums a little bit in it if you wanted to. Oh, yeah. Kind of play around yeah, you could, yeah, you could definitely do a lot of stuff to this one. And, and like we said before, you could add some of those fall spices, some nutmeg and all, of, all that. Um, but we're going to take that kind of flavor from the coffee, so we didn't add that in to this recipe. Nice. So the plating is going to be the parsnip puree on the bottom. Yes. Right? And then you have the pork loin on the top. So we'll have the, the parsnip puree on the bottom, and then on the left-hand side we'll have the carrots, and then next to it we'll have uh, the pork. And then it'll go pistachios, a little bit of sauce, and then I've got some beautiful microgreens here nice. to top it off with. I think we should be pretty close on this, so it'll be just about time to uh, blend this here. I think your Vitamix is down to the right there, yeah. This is another thing that I noticed uh, in the behind the scenes Top Chef kitchen, literally everybody used Vitamix. Like everybody, everybody, everybody. We, there were so many Vitamixes. <laughs> it's a popular thing to make delicious purees. So if you're lucky enough to have a Vitamix, you do wanna do this when the stuff is as warm as possible. It's just gonna help it blend better. Um, if you don't have a Vitamix, let it cool for a little bit so you don't burn yourself. I was gonna say that's like totally contrary to what I would do <laughs> because I don't have one. <laughs> I would let it cool a little bit. Although, immersion blender, I usually like kind of get right in there. Yeah, with the immersion blender, you, you can get right in there. All right. I've broken multiple immersion blenders. I'm on my third one. So with the Vitamix, we're going to make sure that we have it on the variable setting. Uh, we don't want to go straight to 10 right away. And then we're going to slowly work our way up to 10. I'm like instinctively standing back. <laughs> <laughs> And make sure you reset it back to one so whoever uses it next doesn't get a big old splash <laughs> in the face. Pro tip. All right, most important step. We're gonna taste it. So is the consistency like mashed potato? The question is about the consistency, whether it's like a mashed potato. So it should be not as thick as a mashed potato. Um, you can kind of see here, it's just slightly thinner. All right, are we hungry? Is it, is it yes, time to eat? Yes, I think it's time to eat. All I'm right. excited, yeah. Let's do it up. Can you do like a mashed potato parsnip combo? Ooh, that's a good question about a mashed potato parsnip combination. I would do something, uh, I would definitely use like a little bit of a, like a sweeter potato, like a, maybe like a Yukon or something like that. And I think that that would work really well, yeah. And the, the potato itself would help give like a little bit more body to this. Mm -hmm. Um, make it a little bit thicker, um, so then you could use it like almost as its own side dish instead of like a bottom of a plate. Yeah. Nice. That, yeah, that w uh, the yellow sweet potato would be great too. All right, so we're gonna attempt this one more time here. We're just gonna make sure it gets to the 145 that we're looking for. If it is not there, we will just flash it for one quick second. Uh, Flashing it, for those that don't know, does not mean what you think it does. It means quickly reheating, which we will do for about five minutes here. It was at about 137 to 141 okay. is what the temp was. So. And what do we want it at? 145, I think? Yeah, 145. 145. Um, yeah, I think with pork, that's usually where I go to. I think about uh, where, what the temperature is when the bugs die. 
like what is bug death? <laughs> Which is just, it's not, that's not a way of actually doing it. <laughs> no, it's not, uh, no. <laughs> it's like, okay, how, like when are the bugs gonna die? Cause I don't wanna make anybody ill, but also I don't want it to be dry. So, bug death. While we're waiting, there was a question uh, that if you have any ideas for recipes off the top of your head that include lion's mane. I absolutely love to use the lion's mane, almost as like a, like a pulled pork substitute. Um, so you can like cook it down really slowly and put like uh, barbecue sauce on it or something like that. Or if you don't care about it having meat on it, some demi gloss and it's, it's absolutely beautiful. I have a dumber question, which okay. is what is lion's mane? This is one of the a, ones a, that a I difficult, would... It's a difficult <laughs> mushroom to cook. I have yeah, cooked lion's yeah. mane a, a, a fair amount because we were members of Vitruvian and they, they grow them there. And so we would get lion's mane and I've tried them maybe three different ways now and I was like, maybe I don't like them. Um, but that sounds, I have not done that and that sounds delicious. Oh yeah. A, they're, they're big, they're, they're big uh, mushrooms. I don't want to say fluffy. That's weird. Flu I mean, fluffy almost does describe it, though. It's yeah, yeah, stringy is yeah. pretty good. Like it's a fluffy mushroom. Um, stri stringy. They're really good for brain food. They're, they are great I've for your brain. I've heard they're great for your brain. I have heard that. <laughs> I just <laughs> like, and so my husband is like, it's okay to not like a mushroom, but I just haven't done that yet. Yeah. No, there's, there's definite, definitely ways to make it. These look better. cool and weird. <laughs> like they look like Cheetah, cheetah carrots. Oh, chef hands. Yeah. <laughs> I know, you've already lost feeling. Yeah, there's, there's nothing left there. <laughs> Those hours, they, I bet your kitchen smells amazing when you do these. Oh, yes. Um, so I, I started them before I came here, and my entire car smelled, I think it still smells like coffee in my car. <laughs> That's not a bad smell. No, no it's not it could bad. be it could be much worse. When I, I worked at coffee shops for like eight years, and uh, my hair would smell like coffee. Like it just everything was going. <laughs> I've had that before. It's up to uh, deep fryer, and that's <laughs> nowhere, nowhere <laughs> near as good. That's worse. That's not much worse. Yeah, I man. I believe that the coffee beans provide enough moisture to roast them. Uh, the, qu surprising. The, the comment is just about how it's surprising that coffee beans provide enough moisture to roast the carrots and so, keep them tender, right? So, yeah. Some of the moisture is actually going to come from the carrot itself. Right. Um, and then having the tin foil over the top is just going to keep every bit of moisture in, which is going to give it that ability to steam. Okay. And there's oils in the coffee too, right? There's oils yeah. in them, like in the, the beans, the coffee beans. Um, so do we want to plate like yes. one, one dish? Just play, let's then, just plate one. Yeah. We'll show the camera and then we'll plate all the rest once we've said goodbye to our friends at home. Alright, so we'll start with a nice dollop of this uh, puree here. I like the idea of if you beef it up with potatoes, it can become like a bigger. <laughs> All right, and then we're just gonna kind of try and make it into a nice little circle here. Big enough that everything can fit in here. So you're gonna wanna fit carrots along this side and pork along this side. Speaking of pork, we probably wanna pull that pork out. <laughs> All right, so then we're going to place three carrots down on this left-hand side. And you say, if you're going to serve this to somebody, you're like, these are coffee roasted carrots. They are fine. They are not, Yeah, they just you know. have an, a little bit of an interesting look to them. They have a very interesting look. So then we can see here, too, once this is hot, this is the consistency that we're going oh, for. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, so it's a little it really bit more liquidy. Out. Yeah. Still, though, like a closer texture to honey than I think of. The honey syrup. For this next step, you want to make sure that you have the sharpest knife you possibly can use. And because we'll, if you don't, it won't go all the way through? No, it will have a hard time um, not tearing the prosciutto itself off. 
If you don't have the sharpest knife in the world, can you use a bread knife? If you do not have the sharpest knife in the world, the bread knife is always a great option. You don't have the sharpest knife in the world, you put a whisker on you have them sharp enough. You sharp so they're so nice. sharp. Yeah. That, is, that is also true. So then we're going to... Did it remembering to sharpen, but like... Kind of dab the pork on here to get any of that little last bit of uh, juice coming off of it. And then we'll Ooh. just set it right there. Our next step is going to be the sauce here. So we'll just do a little bit of sauce over the top. And then we'll come around the... Not, not bad over. And then we'll just come over the side of the plate here. How oh, pretty. That. Give it a little bit of this pistachio. Now with the pistachio, I like to put a little bit over the top here, but then I also like to give it a couple piles here and here. This is mostly just for the aesthetics, um, <laughs> but I think that that looks pretty nice. The eater loves it, yeah. And then we'll take some of these pea shoots here and then just gently lay it over the top here. These are supercharged pea shoots from our buddies at Supercharge. I love it. And the great thing about Supercharge is you can get these almost anywhere. Um, you know, I had originally said Medcalf's and then I ended up at Jenny Street. They're there um, and they're, they're local. Uh, I think they might have moved, but they're just like right they're downtown Madison. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's and try And that's the, the finished plate. That's this beautiful plate. Beautiful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, of course. This was so much fun. I'm going to hand this over to Allie so she can get a nice shot of it here. That's gorgeous. And we'll turn it back over to Chris. And before we go, just wanted to take out one last opportunity to say thank you to our sponsors, Kessenix and to Leopold's. And if you are interested in coming to, to join us sometime to ha have, a, have this dish and to share a glass of wine, uh, please join us at membership.captimes.com. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>